Obesity, is it a disease? Let's start there. Is this a genetic disease or a lifestyle disease? Dr. Rudy Eberwin has over 20 years clinical experience utilizing GLP-1 medications for various metabolic issues such as diabetes and obesity. He is board certified in both internal medicine and age management medicine. He is the medical director of a major nursing home in Miami, Florida, as well as the Native American Mikusiki Health Clinic. Let's get into the GLPs. Let's talk about how much the celebrities are now starting to come out. Oprah has been using GLP-1. She finally came out and admitted it. She did a show, she did an amazing show with three female doctors and really explains the science of GLP-1, how obesity is a disease and she suffers from the disease. She said that for me, I didn't want to take it because I felt like it would be taking the easy way out. But what I like about Oprah is she talked about how much shame she had about bringing that up, that she was using a GLP-1. Kelly Clarkson, another celebrity who lost a lot of weight. Charles Barkley was very open about it. He said, my fat ass lost 60 plus pounds on Mount Jowell. Rosie O'Donnell was the first person who talked about the food noise. Just my clinical observation, the more overweight someone gets, the more it becomes harder for them to come out of that hole. Obesity, there's almost a point of no return. And now, consistent long-term use of GLP-1. What is the one thing you can do that will most likely help you keep your weight up? People were saying it's Mediterranean diet, keto diet, a low-fat diet, exercising three times a day. I was like, all those are good, but the most important one is your People looking at you now, you showed me your before pictures. I, I, I can barely picture you in that 300 pounds. So kudos to you, man. You're an inspiration to everybody watching this and you're helping so many people. And welcome everybody to the Dr. Jones Lasting Weight Loss Lounge. We're here with Dr. Rudy Eberwein, and this is actually our third episode together, man. It's been a blast every time I have you because you're just a wealth of knowledge in the GLP space. Tell me right now, you're in Thailand. What are you up to right now? <laughs> First, thanks and happy new year. So excited, man. The same way, I, I have so much respect and admiration for what you do, Dean. You're amazing. So it's an honor and a pleasure for me to be here with you. So I'm actually in, in Thailand right now. I'm in an island called Koh Sumai, and I'm doing a yearly retreat detox. So it's we're doing seven days. It's a 10-day, but I'm doing seven, where we fast. I've done juice fasting, water fast, colonics daily, so good gut health. We do yoga, breath work, cold plunges every day. And we do deep dive into meditation, wellness. It's been amazing, man. I've lost 10 pounds. I'm not bloated anymore. I feel great. I'm connected to nature. I'm connected to our inner force. And, and I, I wanted us to do this for the first, although I'm in Thailand, because in January, it is when everybody's thinking about weight loss. So we need to really do this. So excited to be here. Yeah, yeah. And when you do trips like that, it is obviously just, it's a whole nother level to be able to have all those pieces aligned. What would you say out of everything you're doing for the people that don't have the opportunity to ever do something like that? What were like, what are some like the, the biggest things that you're so far noticing that maybe could be implemented to people's kind of standard day to day? Definitely. You don't need to come all the way to Thailand. So the, the juice fast. So we did two day juice fast, two day water fast with colonics. My God, colonics are important. I haven't been eating but when they do the colonics, it's weird and a little strange. But stuff that's coming out of me, it's a little gross, but it's crazy. But all this accumulated gunk, um, it's amazing. So just this and really be connected to, to why you hear your wellness, your inner warrior, your inner um, healer. Uh, reconnect with vibration. Reconnect with source. Reconnect with God. Br breath work. So everybody can... Dedicate you at home. Say, I'm going to do two or three days on my own. I'll do a juice fast. I'll do some breath work. I'll do if you can, I have access to a colonic, you do it. But the most important thing, what this is doing for me, it's helping me reconnect with, with the mystery of God because my body feels so, so, so well. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that's definitely probably one of the big goals if you are fortunate enough to get to a trip like that. On the juicing, uh, for you guys, are you doing like a strictly sugar-free juice right now? Uh, or is there some sugar in the fructose form, of course, uh, with what you're juicing? No. Yeah. So, so we're juicing organic fruits. So we have three fruit juices and three vegetable juices daily. We also take chlorella, spirulina, 
We're taking bentonite clay to really help clean us up. Then today and tomorrow, we're doing water fast. Just water fast and continuing the colonics and all of those things daily. So would you say for people wanting to replicate little pieces on their own and they do have body fat to lose and they're not already in a good state like you are to maybe just focus on things like celery, cucumber, anything else that you think would be good for people that have that fat to lose and they're juicing? Definitely. More the vegetable ju juices. We did a lot of beet juice, really good. We did carrot and oranges. So although you get some of the sugar, you get all the pulp and the fiber from it also. So it's okay to consume sugar in this. We're doing a lot of uh, shots of ginger and turmeric um, really help us clean up. Wow. Yeah, that's freaking amazing. I'm way overdue for that, man. But yeah, let's, I know we could talk forever just about your trip, but let's get into the GLPs. I know that's what we have been talking primarily about episodes one and two. And here we are again. And I know there's more in front of us with the landscape right now. What, let's start there. Like what's going on right now on the landscape as far as availability of this medication, there's national shortage. What should we know what that's going on? Well, right now? So, so before we even start that, let's talk about how much people are using it and how much the celebrities are now starting to come out and say that. I think we said that on your show. I've always wow, said Oprah. Oprah has been using GLP-1. She just didn't want to admit it. She finally came out and admitted it. She did a show. She did an amazing show with three female doctors and really explains the science of GLP-1, how obesity is a disease, and she suffers from the disease. But on that show, she said that for me, I didn't want to take it because I felt like it would be taking the easy way out. Even at that time, I was like, Oprah, there is no way. You're 68 or 69. You've dealt with obesity your whole life. And all of a sudden, you lose 40 pounds at 69 years old. And you told us you were only walking. I knew from that time she was taking GLP-1. And she's part of Weight Watchers. Weight Watchers bought a company that prescribes Ozempic. Yeah, I so saw that. I knew she did. So she finally came out and admitted it. But what I like about Oprah is she's talked about how much shame she had about bringing that up, that she was using a GLP-1. And I think that's one of the most important things we need to talk about today. Kelly Clarkson, another celebrity who lost a lot of weight in the beginning. And all of them, I agree. I respect people's privacy. People don't need to know how you lose your weight. But because they're in the public eye, everybody's asking. So Kelly Clarkson denied it also in the beginning. Then she came out and said, yes, I use a GLP-1. Of course, it's not just the GLP-1 medication. Of course, they do their part. They eat better, they exercise, everything we talk about. It's not just the medication. But to me, the most important thing that I want to do and that I want us to achieve is removing the shame for people who need to lose weight that take the GLP-1 and feel shame, not only to themselves, but their peers, their friends, their colleagues are putting shame and putting a shameful eye on them. It is a medication that use, that's for metabolic improvement. There should be no shame in using it. Where do you think, like, where does the shame come from? The obvious, the, the first thing that I think of is just the fact that the idea that it's all in your head, it's you. When it comes to the basis of obesity, you just got to stop eating, put the fork down. Is, is that really it? Is that, it's that simple. That's why there's so much shame over reaching for help because the idea is you shouldn't need the help. What's wrong with you? Is that what it is? I think so. Of course, that's going to be a complex thing, a psychosocial type of issue. But there's no question that we're seeing obesity and weight as a willpower problem. Right? You go to the doctor and what do they tell you? Just eat less and exercise. If it was that easy, we would not have 70% of the population that's overweight. 35 to 40% is obese. There is something else going on. And it is really the insulin resistance and our toxic foods that we're eating. And now it hijacks our nervous system and our neurotransmitters that really, Gene, you've gone through it yourself and we talk to patients enough. When you have a patient who is in the throes of stress eating, sugar addiction, you tell them not to eat. It's almost impossible. Yeah. So there's I... a shame. So most people will say that. And, and when I post things on social media, you too, a lot of people say, oh, that's cheating. Do it the natural way. Men up. You can do it on your own. No, enough. Enough of this. This is really, and we're going to go later. We, we talked about this also. Is this a disease? Is this a genetic disease or a lifestyle disease? It's a combination of the two. 
hundred percent. I have a lot of things that I want to pick your brain on when we get past the, the current scene right now, but okay. So definitely we'll table that for a couple of minutes. So what, yeah. Didn't you mention you there's, so we have Oprah, Kelly Clarkson too. She finally came out. Yeah. I, I, I wonder Charles how much Barkley. Charles Barkley, it, but he's, he's been very open. He said, my fat ass lost 60 plus pound on Mount Jao. And he was what very you, open. <laughs> Rosie O'Donnell came out and Rosie O'Donnell was the first person who talked about the food noise, how that medication decreased the food noise. It's really not just about not eating or the weight that you see going down because a lot of patients, when they lose their weight, it, it's really like the maintenance of the, you don't have that always your mind thinking about food. What am I going to eat next? What's for dinner? I can't believe I ate this. Why so want pizza? Your mind, somebody dealing with obesity and weight issues, you have those little addiction, that monkey mind in your brain that keeps calling your name with those bad foods. Yeah, and 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 I won't go too far into it because what we're we're gonna get to it, but I, I feel like that idea on the calorie counting side of obesity, part of what fuels that is the fact that at any given moment, me, yourself, or, or almost anybody can take 100% of their attention units if the situation called for it or as much as free and say, okay, for the next day or two, if my life depended on it, if somebody had a gun on me, I could fast for two days, right? I can force myself to get into a massive caloric deficit. Same thing, I can force eat, right? Because we do have a conscious ability to take all of our attention units and, and cause either a surplus or a deficit, there's this assumption that I can do it 100% of the time. but it's like they, they they forget that reality sets in and most people require the majority of their attention units at every given moment just to survive their day to day, their job, their kids, their work. They can't be allocating all of that attention units with the exception of maybe some momentary times when the occasion arises for it. So we all are going to be operating back to that, like the systems innately that are running us, which Hormones is obviously the, the, the big one of it. So we'll, we'll, I have a lot of uh, pieces of that. But beautifully uh, said, man, beautifully said. Again, Dean, I love the way you speak, the way you put it, uh, what you're doing with your patients. It, it's true, man. Listen, we are stronger than, than we think. We need to give our patients more credit. You can fast. I usually tell my patients, yeah, you don't think you can do it? Yes, you can. Start slow. Whether you go in, in, into a full fast, your fast is extreme, but it works. A two-day fast, can you build yourself to this? Of course. What, like the human body can achieve amazing things. What the GLP-1 medications do, it gives patients that hope that, you know what, I can. Because when it decreases that inflammation, it decreases that dopamine release from foods and from drinks, that now your mind can now think logically and you are able to do it. And once you do it, the first, a lot of my patients, when they start fasting, all they can do is the 12 hours on, 12 hours off. And I'm like, that's okay. You start it's good with starting. It. Then you try to a 14 hour fast, then a 16, then an 18. Then you stay with the 18. Then you try to do a 24 hour. Then you try to do a two, two day. It's like you challenge yourself. That's how the human body evolved. We evolved for feast and famine. Your book again, man, I read it a second time. Your book is amazing. I, that mean, it really means the world to me to hear that from you because you've been doing this for so long and I'm really fortunate to have crossed paths with you and I'm glad this, it's funny that this late in our relationship, we barely realized we both had this passion. We talked about hormones. I think we were talking about SIBO before, maybe doing something for that. And then little did we know we both, this is our number one passion. So that's, that's number super one awesome. Passion. Yeah. And number one passion on the number one problem in our society, insulin resistance equals aging. It is that simple. As we age, we develop insulin resistance, more visceral adipose tissue, more belly fat, more inflammation, and starts the cascade of prediabetes, chronic inflammation, diabetes, heart attack, stroke, cancers, dementia, all of this. And that's why GLP-1 has been shown to reduce all of those diseases I just mentioned, because the base of it is insulin resistance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I like the tried and true three things I focus on the most with patients, insulin resistance, inflammation, and then metabolic flexibility. I wanted to interrupt the show to tell you guys about the free resources that I have for you to be successful. The link in the show notes is going to provide you a way to join the free Facebook community. We do weekly live training. It's a great community. We'll answer all your questions with or without the medications. We're going to help you get there. And there's a free PDF which breaks down the steps so that you know exactly what to do, how to do it to be absolutely successful this year for your weight loss goals. Now back to the show. Tell me 
what's your take on this national shortage? Like, when do you think, in, in your opinion, obviously we don't know, but would you say that the pharmaceutical companies are doing everything they can to, to end this shortage because they, they want just their product out there in the market? What's your opinion on all this? Listen, I don't know. Big pharma, you never know what they're thinking. They're making buckets of money out of this. Good for them. I say they should have gotten, GLP-1 should have gotten the Nobel Prize last year for medicine because it is changing medicine. The mRNA discovery got the Nobel Prize next year, last year. But semaglutide got molecule of the year in 2023. It is an amazing discovery. Yes, from what I hear, especially now that tilzepatide, which is the generic for Mount Jao and Zebbound, apparently Eli Lilly is opening new factories and they say they are going to be able to do more. But everybody wants to be on this because it's helping so many people. So there is shortage. So at my primary care practice, I work at a Native American reservation clinic in the Miami area. And we have about 800 patients and we have about maybe 150 diabetics. All of my diabetics are on GLP-1. And I use mostly Mount Jaro because definitely that is a superior molecule compared to Ozempic. So in that clinic, even there, although they have great access to all the pharmacy to federal programs, sometimes we do get shortages. We can't get the five milligram. We can't get the 7.5. So we have to play around with it. So that's for the diabetic covered by insurance. Now, people for weight loss, most insurances do not cover those medications for weight loss. Although they are now FDA approved, both of them, both semaglutide and tiazepatide have been FDA approved for weight loss, very difficult to get coverage for them. Can you cover, I know you started getting into it, but just for the sake of everybody listening, can we cover the brand names, the generic names, just to clarify, because there's a lot of them out, there's a lot of names, and I think I have it right, but I'll, I'll resort to you to clarify. They make the GLP-1 names so confusing. So <laughs> let me list them. You have Wigovi, Ozempic, Mount Jaro and Zebbao. Everybody's confused, right? So the easiest thing, that's why me and you, when we talk about the generic, the chemical name of the formula. So semaglutide, which is the GLP-1 that came out in 2017, is Ozempic and Wigovi. Basically, Ozempic was first FD approved. They branded semaglutide as Ozempic for diabetes. When, the, when it became FD approved for weight loss, they made a nice little marketing trick they're like, yeah, it's the same exact formula. We're going to call it Wigovi. Wigovi can go up to 2.4 milligrams, whereas Ozempic only goes up to 2 milligrams. But up to 2 milligrams, they're interchangeable. It's the exact same thing. So they did the same thing for tilzepatide. Tilzepatide was first branded as Mount Jao for diabetes. Once tilzepatide got approval for weight loss, Eli Lilly changed, not changed the name, branded another one. It's called Zepbound. And then Zepbound is the one that's FDA approved for weight loss. But whether it's Mount Jao, Zepbound, Tilzepatide, they're all the same. Let me give you a little way to think about it. A lot of people like to take z to sleep, Z-Sleep. It's Benadryl. It's diphenhydramine. So it is the same exact um, generic name. The chemical formula is the same. They put the brand name different. It keeps us confused. So it's very confusing. For it makes it seem like it's something different. <laughs> it's the same. Yeah. So people will tell me, no, I, I, I don't want Mount Jao. I want Zebbound. I said it's exactly the same thing. Tilzepatide, Zebbound, Mount Jao. Generic name, two brand names, exact same chemical composition, exact same physiological effects. Yeah. Yeah, I know that. That's... That makes a lot of sense. Are you using any of the shorter acting single day injection versions or those are completely out of your practice now? Oh, no. So I use them a lot in diabetes. So when we had them, the, the, um, the liraglutide, Baeda, Victoza, some of them started as daily. No. First, for weight loss, they are not great. So I've been using GLP-1 since 2008 for my diabetic patients. They weren't great for weight loss. I use a lot of what's called Saxenda, Bayeda, and those are the brand names. There's Liraglutide, there's Exenatide, which is Bidurion. I use a lot of those. Really good for diabetes, but they weren't that great for weight loss. Liraglutide or Trulicity was decent for weight loss. This one is like the middle one. Yeah, Yeah, 2014. And that, but it's 2017 when Semaglutide came out. They did something to the, they refined the molecule that it binds differently. That's when we started seeing a lot of weight loss. 
And those are all single day? No. Uh, uh, semaglutide, tiozepatide, liraglutide, all of those are weekly. Those are weekly, but uh, yeah, the, yeah, the earlier, all, all those ones prior, earlier, those are all daily. Earlier version of single day. And now also they have semaglutide oral. The semaglutide oral, the brand name is Ribelsis. And they did a study. I've used uh, Ribelsis on my diabetic patients. Uh, we didn't get great results. I don't like it. I'd rather do the weekly injection. But they did a study where they did higher dose oral semaglutide, and there were good results. So if there's patients who really don't want to get injections, Ribelsis or oral semaglutide is available. Yeah. Would you say the... Uh... We, 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 and this is general too when we talk about medication specifically about this but in general if we're going to go the oral route we have to consider a lot of aspects like the body's the person's body's ability to absorb what's going on with their digestion the past of the liver and metabolization all of that's going to potentially affect it in a way that reduces the absorption D definitely and but that's why they did the study and, and i forgot the name of the study but they looked at higher dose oral semaglutide, and it had decent results, but not even compared to the injectable. So for me, exactly what you said, the difference should be most likely first pass metabolism through the liver. Everybody's cytochrome enzymes may be different, rate of absorption. So you do the injectable once a week, you bypass a lot of this. To me, that's a much easier way. You were saying the other day, now they're finding a gel that you're going to be able to do a GLP-1 once every four months. That's going to be a slow release of GLP-1. The, the future of metabolic medicine is bright. Yeah. 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 So again, that's more top. Every time we do a show, we're going to come up with more topics, topics. For, the, for, for the next show. Let's transition into. So we were talking about the societal views and, and, and where it came from, right? That basis of obesity, right? Because this is such a fueled and controversial topic for discussion and a lot of disagreement, right? In your opinion, what is that the basis of obesity? First of all, let's take, actually, let's take a step back. Is it a disease? Let's start there. Yeah, that, that's a great place to start. Is it a disease? Yes. So it is now classified as a disease that had a CD, an ICD-10 code for it. So you can code for it. So in the U.S., if you don't have a code, an ICD-10 code, you're not a disease. So it was finally classified as a disease. Which is now great. what what just to go really nuance in that because for me personally I don't regard their classification it means there's value there for sure insurance companies that's the only way to get paid but that's what's the definition like what's the definition of a disease to you and, and does it correlate with what how they got it to that point to call it a disease so that that's the great point so first I'm glad we always knew that there was metabolic derangement in obesity it wasn't just a willpower issue right me and you always knew that. There's hormonal at play. There's all of those things. There's chronic inflammation, and it's a vicious cycle. So that's why the disease is, right? Something that, that is not just something that is made up. There's a real syndrome of chronic inflammation, hormonal things, psychosocial issues. To me, the fact that it got an ICD-10 code legitimizes it. Now, the big question, is it a genetic disease or is it a lifestyle disease? And that's the big question. And then now, for sure, if you listen to Oprah talked about this, all the makers of the GLP ones, they're all saying, and I agree, it is a genetic disease. There are people, and you know that, Dean, you'll be with a friend next to you. The friend can eat anything they, they want. They don't gain weight. You smell the food, you gain weight. Metabolism is something that is inherited, is genetic, is determined by your genes, not just inherited, just determined by your genes. But my prop, when you say it's a genetic disease, I agree 50%. Because knowing that it's a genetic disease, you're going to be like, wow, okay, it is something that I have to deal with. Those are the cards I was dealt with. The one thing I don't like when you say it's a genetic disease is you can fall into victimhood. You can just say, it's in my genes. I don't have a, a choice. That's what's going to happen to me. I'm going to stay overweight. It, it is what it is. Although I'm all for the body positivity movement, accept your body just how it is, we should always strive to be metabolically healthy, no matter what your weight is. So when it's a genetic disease, I like that they say that. And, and a quick thing on genetic disease, there please, are please. Mono, monogenic obesity, things like Prader-Willi syndrome, and there's a few name syndromes that really have a deletion on a gene, and, you, and all of those patients have obesity, even if you don't feed them. So this is really monogenic obesity. What we're talking about is polygenic obesity. 
that you may have different, although we have the human genome now, there's not one gene for obesity. So you may have a SNP or a deletion in one that makes your metabolism slower, that another one that makes you accumulate more visceral adipose tissue versus the next one. Another SNP makes it that you make more white fat versus brown fat. And you, when you accumulate all those, that person may have more tendency to gain weight. But it's a 50% in my mind. The other 50% is lifestyle because genes only load the gun. The environment pull the trigger. Meaning that even if you have the genes, even if your parents have it, even if you know that you have a slow metabolism, you just seeing where you are, if you modify your environment, if you eat healthier, if you exercise, you stay away from toxins, you can overcome that genetic predisposition. It's harder, but you can do it. Dan. So this is such an interesting, I love the way you said that, genetic-based versus lifestyle-based disease. Now, the reality is, tell me if you agree, like every single condition, it, it, it's a spectrum. It's not black and white, right? And, and, and when people say the word genetic disease, right, there's, we're generally speaking, talking about diseases that really are on the spectrum closer to 80, 90%, which means, translation, not much you can do to fix that or reverse that, you're more or less stuck with it, right? With the very far sweeping exceptions. Then when you move down the spectrum, you're saying 50-50, that, that, that's 50-50, 60-40. You start moving away from genetic, you start moving to more lifestyle-based disease. Now we're saying, okay, it's still a disease, which I wanna get to the definition of that still in a second, but we're saying because it's less genetic contribution that you have more of an ability to reverse it or at least put it in remission. Is that, that my understanding you correctly? Completely. And that's the concept of genetics and epigenetics. So genetics are what you're born with. That's the blueprint, right? That's the blueprint that your genes are to make proteins. Epigenetics means above the genes. That's what controls what genes are going to be expressed. So the same thing, a big thing I'm looking into now, hemochromatosis, hereditary hemochromatosis, right? So when you have that, patients tend to increase their iron intake. But if you change your diet, if you change, although you have the gene, you could mitigate that. So your environment, your controlled genetics, your epigenetics control your genes. There are some disease, genetic disease, that have what we call 100% pen penetrance. Meaning that no matter what your diet, your environment is, you get 100% of the disease. So those conditions are, are, are clear. We barely see those conditions. Those are the prader willis syndrome. They have all those weird names. I can't even remember all of them. I learned them in med school. So those are seen by geneticists, by tertiary care centers. But most other ones, you may have a genetic predisposition, but your epigenetics, your environment, your diet, your toxins, even your thoughts can control the expression of those genes. So God, that makes so much sense. And again, the understanding the, the spectrum is what can give hope to people too, as well, as far as what you said. And I think so it is important us and people understand that there is a spectrum. So that way we can set up realistic expectations for what's possible, what's not. Going back to disease. So let me put my spin on it. And, and I want to hear your definition, right? Because we just talked about the, the how much it can be fixed or not based off genetics versus lifestyle. But the fact that we're still calling it something, right? We're calling it a disease. So what is that definition to you? A disease uh, in general. I, I'll let you go first. Okay. Okay. So for me, when I think of disease, I because an example of someone who doesn't have a disease in this scenario, weight loss, we're talking about a person that has to lose 15 pounds, right? We wouldn't say that they, they, they don't have obesity. They don't have the disease, right? But, but that's where I find myself wondering, are we saying that they have no decreased or increased ability? Like it's harder for them. It's not going to be harder for them until they hit BMI 35 or 30. Like I want to really have a deeper understanding of that. So for me, just my clinical observation, the more overweight someone gets, the more it becomes harder for them to come out of that hole. And it doesn't just start, the disease for me doesn't just start when they become BMI uh, 30 or 35, wherever we're considering obesity. So for me, it starts from the moment you start becoming a couple pounds overweight. So that I find it interesting that we call it a disease at that point, 
So that's where I'm a little bit looking for additional clarification to understand because that spectrum that I've observed clinically starts from, you know, 15 pounds overweight, for example. So I'm not sure to be completely honest. Like, I, I, that's why I'm curious of your take. No, it's, you make a great point. And to me, there's not an exact definition because what you're saying is exactly this. And everything in life is on a spectrum. So when the patient is not even, let's say, he's only 10, 15 pounds over it as a little pouch and has some chronic inflammation, has maybe like fasting, hyperinsulinemia, is it a disease already? Or do we wait until the BMI is 30 to call it a disease? So they are calling it diabetes. So for example, to define that, because insulin resistance is on a spectrum. It's on a spectrum from any kind, anytime you accumulate visceral adipose tissue, you have hyperinsulin, your, your cells are resistant to insulin, you start getting more, more weight, especially more belly fat, then it goes into high blood sugar in the morning, fasting hyperglycemia. Then it goes to pre-diabetes, then diabetes, then heart disease, then stroke, then cancer, then Alzheimer's disease. So all of this can be a disease. Obesity is at the base of it. So now I, I, I listened to a podcast the other day, and I did a podcast with her, the, the Plus Sides podcast. And she was she's overweight, has dealt with PCOS her whole life, and using GLP-1, she doesn't have diabetes. So somebody commented on her page that because of people like you don't have diabetes, I'm a diabetic and I cannot find my medication. And she made a really good point. She's like, why are we hating on each other? We are on the same spectrum of the disease. Yours has just progressed a little more. She is just at the obesity part. But your point is well taken. What about the person who's 10 pounds overweight, not 50 pounds? Do we label it a disease? I don't want to label it a disease because disease brings victimhood. But at the same time, where is that point that you call it? It's really difficult. But if we approach anybody, so in my practice, I get a lot of patients that we call skinny fat, normal weight, but metabolically unhealthy. You check their CRP level, you check their, their inflammatory markers. They, 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 are, they are slim, BMI of 24, 25, but they have a belly fat. They have insulin resistance. This is this person also needs intervention. Hopefully, because it's not too down, too far down the spectrum, minor intervention like the right nutrition, exercise, and sleep can fix that quote-unquote disease. But as it progresses, you may need pharmacological intervention. I think that, yeah, that's that makes a lot of sense. And I'm 100% in agreement not using the word disease but at the same time, I can tell you how I operate right now. We're, we're, we're trying to make sense of it from a scientific basis. What do we know to be fact? Obviously, this is all still a lot to be uh, further progressed in, 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 in literature sense and in, in science. But I operate, like we were saying earlier, it's a spectrum from the first couple pounds overweight. And, and the deeper and deeper you go, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, you are making it that much harder. And then like you said, we call it a disease at this certain point between zero to 100. But that just means you hit that point. But this process was developing the whole time, meaning you should take responsibility for it as quickly as you can. And, and, and the people that are finally doing something about it when they're obese, I get so much, and, I, and, and this is, it's tough, right? Because with all the videos I make, educating people on how to wean off the meds, I get so much defensive responses back and I get it. I, I understand this is a disease. How dare you? Or you wouldn't tell somebody who's finally normalized their blood pressure through medication to, to stop blood pressure medication. <laughs> That's a logical statement. But then my response is always, if I can get my blood pressure stabilized and then do lifestyle so that you don't need the medication, why would you continue to take the medication? That's always my response back. And I'm trying to find, and I, like you, find that perfect balance where we can communicate to patients that this is a spectrum. You should be aware of it. If you let it progress, it will progress to a disease, but wh whatever the, the whatever you want to call it, whatever you want to label it, it's still something that you should stop now because we know at this point, the, the, the longer you let it progress, the more weight you develop, even if it doesn't aesthetically bother you, <laughs> it, it's, it's affecting your health and you're only making it that much harder. So you should stop it now, stop it and prevent it now. The same thing goes for diabetes. Imagine if doctors were telling their patients, 
years before their A1C creeped up to 5.7, this 5.7, what if they were actually, what if insurance companies covered fasted insulin panels and they could <laughs> tell their patient, oh, your fasted insulin level starting to creep up four years earlier, however long it takes, but just imagine how much more they could have done about it. Yeah. So that's a great point. In fact, that's a very triggering comment that, that all of us get. Why would you tell somebody to come off their medication? A lot of those diseases, diabetes, obesity, even a lot of the blood pressure. And again, blood pressure, that's not related to what we call like a secondary causes. Like if you have renal artery stenosis, if you have different things that no matter what, you can be at your healthiest, you have high blood pressure. Yes, yep. you need to stay on the medication. 100%. But we've had so many people that with the help of diet and now GLP-1, we can take them off their diabetes and blood pressure medication. But that's when, again, what me and you do, I think is amazing. If you listen to Eli Lilly and Novo Nordisk, their reps are telling you people should go on, on those medications and never come off. That's a bonus for them. They'll make money forever. My stand, and I see your stand is the same. I'm like, get on the medication at whichever place you are, whether you have 15 pounds to lose or 100 pounds to lose. If you have inflammation, visceral adipose tissue, you're at risk of progressing down that route. So use whatever means necessary. And always, we always start with better nutrition, exercise, fixing your sleep. Then you use the medication. But once you use them, and, and what I tell patients, the magic of GLP-1 is time. People think it's a quick weight loss. Some people get quick weight loss, but that's not it. Most of my patients by month four, month six, when the metabolism gets better, when, when their habits start getting better, that's when the magic happens. Now, let's say six months, nine months, a year, the person has lost their weight. And I will tell them, do you think we can try to taper you off? See how you do. Try to prove to yourself, can you do it? And I tell them, you do this with absolutely no shame. You try to come off of it. You try to keep all your good habits. I have patients who lasted three months, a year and a half. I have a, patient, I have a bunch of patients who've never needed to come back. But I tell them, you should have what I call a panic weight should be about 10 pounds above your lowest weight. Because on a weekend, you go out, you can fluctuate easily, three to five pounds. But if you start seeing after you lost your weight and you decided with your provider that I'm going to stop and see, you keep your good habits. If you see the weight is creeping up, seven pounds, 10 pounds, 12 pounds, get back on it. Don't let that fire start again. The ashes started again. And I tell people, go back on it with no shame. You did not fail. Go back on it with no shame. And I have other patients, because I really feel what you said is important. Obesity, there's almost a point of no return, where there's so much chronic inflammation, so much leptin resistance, and all the other hormones we don't even know about yet, that you'll see them. Once you're 70, 100 pounds overweight, that's why bariatric surgery was so powerful and, and useful, because those patients feel their weight a lot. But either bariatric surgery and now, consistent long-term use of GLP-1, you can achieve 20, 25, 30% uh, weight loss. And with this, your physiology is different. You don't have chronic inflammation the same way. Your cravings are not the same. Your leptin is more resistant. Your insulin works better. So you're a different person. So I feel like that person deserves the right to try to see if they can do it on their own. And if they cannot, go back on the medication. Same thing with blood pressure. If I have a patient that lost 50 pounds, it's possible they don't need their blood pressure medication. If I keep them on blood pressure meds, I will drop their blood pressure, and that's dangerous. So I have them come off the blood pressure medication. They continue monitoring their blood pressure, and they keep their good habits. If they start gaining weight or the habits are bad, the blood pressure goes back up, we go back on it. So it is very dynamic and flexible. Yeah. But it's a very yeah. triggering comment. People I know, that people have very strong opinions each way. On us as the providers, this is how we do it. And I feel like this is personalized medicine. It's not one size fits all. If it's one person, they need to stay on it for life. All my diabetics stay on it for life. I've had a few patients that diabetics are different. I had a few patients that I came off GLP ones because their um, A1C of 11, 12, reversed their diabetes a year and a half, came off. They didn't keep their good habits, but it came back. So quickly put them back. When you have diabetes, maybe a little different. Obesity, because you're earlier in the spectrum, you have more chances of not needing it for life. But if you need it for life, I'm great with this. If we can take you off, even better. So 
up and down. I wanted to interrupt the show to tell you guys about the free resources that I have for you to be successful. The link in the show notes is going to provide you a way to join the free Facebook community. We do weekly live training. It's a great community. We'll answer all your questions with or without the medications. We're going to help you get there. And there's a free PDF which breaks down the steps so that you know exactly what to do, how to do it to be absolutely successful this year for your weight loss goals. Now back to the show. Totally, totally. And, and diabetes is, by the way, my second passion after, after obesity, number one, but diabetes, number two, because of how intertwined the origin of each of those diseases are. So we definitely should talk about that on later but, but, shows. But sorry, di- diabetes and obesity, it's the same disease. It's a different spectrum. It is insulin resistance. 100%. 100%. It, yes. Yeah. And now I tell my patients, and imagine if every provider, every doctor could tell their patient that when you get a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes, First, it should be done earlier. I don't even like the name pre-diabetes. You can't, it's not, like, it's like pregnancy. It's not like you, 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 you pre-pregnant or pregnant. You either have insulin resistance or you don't. Whether your A1C is 5.6 or 6.8, you are in that same disease spectrum. I don't like pre-diabetes because when you say pre-diabetes, people think that, oh, I don't have it yet. So I don't need to change it. Hundred percent. Oh, my doctor told me. My doctor told me I, I, I don't have to worry about it yet, but maybe I should start thinking about it eventually. You know, oh my gosh! Pre diabetes to me is an emergency. You started that spectrum, and it's a downward spiral. A it downward literally spiral. means your. It literally means your body is failing. It's been fighting for the past four to five years to keep that from ever happening, and now this higher level of blood sugar is the best it can do, doing everything that it possibly can. Yeah, it's like a student at school, right? They start. They they, they used to get A plus. Now you see them getting B's and C's. Are you going to wait till they fail the class to get a tutor for them? By the time I see a C, I'm like, something's going on. Let's intervene. And first intervention is not always medication. But if you let, that's when the term disease is important. Because if you tell the pre-diabetic, oh, you just have a touch of sugar. That's what a lot of people like to say. They won't make the quick. If you tell them you have a disease, they will make the change. So this is where I like the term disease because sometimes it puts people into action. Yeah, exactly. Because it's like my life's now my life might depend on it. And that's when I lost 300 pounds, when I finally made that decision, my parents, healthy parents trying for so long and I wanted to lose weight too, but for whatever reason, I couldn't do it. And then when I hit, when I broke 300 pounds, I had that, I might die moment and I was ready to do something. And I was, <laughs> I was, and it was like within six months, I lost 100 pounds. It's crazy what Every, every time you, talk, you tell your story, Gene, I get goosebumps. See, yeah. every it's, time you say it, because people looking at you now, you showed me your before pictures. I, I, I can barely picture you at that 300 <laughs> pounds. So kudos to you, man. You're an inspiration to everybody watching this, and you're helping so many people. We have that inner force, that inner healer that we can get. Sometimes the toxins, the hormones... The, the this metabolism that we get gets crowded. Our mind gets crowded. Sometimes it takes you realizing at 300 pounds, my God, I'm going to die. Sometimes that's the wake-up call. And it's not your parents who can do it for you. You have to get it. But the day you realize this, there are so many tools that can now help that person. And you're a living testament of this. Yeah, 100%. 100%. I wanted to go over a study that came out recently. And it was on ZepBound specifically. So ZepBound that was FDA approved for weight loss. And it came out maybe last week. And they followed patients for 88 weeks. And they saw that when the patient stopped the medication, they regained half of the weight within one year. A lot of people are saying, so see, they need to stay on it. So there's two ways I'm looking at it. First, they regain half of the weight in one year. So if you have a patient who lost 60 pounds, they regain 30 they are still minus 30. It's still a positive. Number two is yes. I'd like to know those patients, what kind of dietary interventions were they doing? Did they go back to their bad habits? So if you go back to your bad habits, you will re-express your genetic disease of obesity because you put your genes into an environment to express obesity. But if you're able to, and again, that's when willpower comes in and that's a difficult conversation. But if you're able to maintain your good habits and there's people who can do it, you're doing it. We have a lot of examples who are doing it. And for the people who cannot and need to go back on the medication, I want to tell them, do it with no shame. 
for whatever reason you can. Is it a willpower thing? Is it a character thing? I don't think so. That's where the genetic disease comes in. It's an addiction, right? That you went back to your addiction. And I'm going to treat with, with a lot of compassion and empathy to be like, it's okay. If you need the medication, we'll heal for you. But if you could do it on your own, great. Yeah, I think that's I think that's very powerful and it makes a lot of sense for me when I'm working with my patients. This is probably the number one reason why people sign up in my program is because I am communicating to people that is what that's the goal here. Like we don't we work with patients that want to come into the program with the goal in mind already. So it's a little bit different, right? It sounds like that's different than you. You're working with everybody and then probably inspiring some people. Hey, let, let's give it a shot. For us, it's definitely more about this is the program. We are doing this for people that already have the intention. And after having this conversation with you, I'm like, do I want to open that up the doors to people that maybe would get there when they see the light? I'm having I'm having considerations here. So that's interesting. But that is definitely what we're doing, what we've been doing is working with people that from the starting point can have that 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 goal. Now I look at it like so starting off, you have these physical, these physiological things, the disease, the insulin resistance, metabolic flexibility, inflammation. And so those are contributing. That's the food chatter. That's where it's so hard to stop, right? So the GLP allows us to handle that. But then now, once the physical barriers are removed, the physiological barriers, right? Now we get into the mental side, right? And possibly the spiritual side, if you, depending on the emotional side, right? What fixes that? And that's deep, right? And so for us, what I found successful is that's where the coaching that I do every week in a group format with people. And what, a lot of the recurring topics we, we talk about is mindset and literally just reminding patients, okay, so physical barriers are getting lower and lower because we're doing the fasting, we're lowering your carbs, we're exercising, we're making all these changes to improve the physical, physiological, but now we have to start thinking and I, I always bring up, I always bring up David Goggins. Okay. Like the most extreme example of mindset, what can mindset do? You don't need to be David Goggins. You just, but, 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 you, but say again for the viewers what he did. Yeah. Oh, David Goggins is an example of what the human mind can do. This guy is has the strongest mindset and they're actually, they're, from what I understand, tell me if you heard differently, they're actually starting to do studies on him just to try to figure out because if, if a human can do this, running hundreds of miles, like just the, his accolades are, are through the roof. He's got the toughest mindset out, out there. I, and I tell people that as a joke, just to set the bar of, hey, here's what a human can do. Now for you, I just need you to give 1% of what that man does. Just begin to operate on this. Okay. The mindset is in, I got to execute. I got to actually remember, okay, I, I shouldn't be eating that because they, the habits are there, right? If you've been for 20 years, or 15 years, you like to have six Oreos after dinner and you crave that, the GLP-1 handles that. Now you don't have the craving, but you still have the habit, right? Or the alcohol drink when you're with your buddies, like all of those habits now still have the mental component. And so that has to be addressed and that takes effort and practice. And like you said, you're gonna fail sometimes, get back on the med to give you a jump start. But then remember, unfortunately, we can't make it so easy to where you can be. And this come, this is where the question comes up, being on the med for life, right? Because if you're on the med for life, you don't have to execute as much of that mental component. And so in order to get the to that goal, in my opinion, we do have to start leaning on the mindset a little bit more and it becomes that balance, right? And what's your take on that as far as executing the mindset after the physical barriers are removed? A hundred percent. And and the mindset, even before they're removed, we work on that from the beginning. So I work with patients like you from from the beginning. I almost don't put that. My, my expectations for them is when you lose the weight, when your metabolism improves, when you're, because once all this improves, when you feel better, you can be better. Your mindset improves. We will decide together what's your best course of action. Most of my patients don't stay on it for life. But it's very expensive to stay on it for a long time if it's not covered by insurance. So most patients go on it and then we work on their mindset. I did a talk one time at a conference and I asked the question, what is the one thing you can do that will most likely help you keep your weight off? People were saying it's Mediterranean diet, keto diet, a low-fat diet, exercising three times a day. 
I was like, all those are good. But the most important one is your mindset. The mindset will help you do any of those things. And the type of mindset we're talking about, it's that resilient mindset. I call it the no matter what mindset. You can overcome anything. Love mindset, growth mindset, meaning that you fall, you get back up, but you look at everything with love. You look at your past with love. I love the stoic quote, Amor Fati, love your faith. Wherever you are in, in life, don't complain about it. Whatever happened to you made you who you are. So your mindset determines everything. In my clinic, a lot of times when people come into me, they're like, oh, my God, I need to lose 50 pounds. It, it, it's so horrible. When I'm going to lose that weight, I'm going to be amazing. I'm like, no, you're amazing and beautiful right now. You just happen to need to lose 50 pounds. Change your mindset that you're not broken because you're overweight. You are amazing. You are loved. You are capable of way more than you need. And you love yourself today, not when you lose that weight. So when you come of it from a place of love and resilience, then the physiological changes happen. Then the weight loss happens. Then it becomes even better. So mindset, as you said it beautifully, it is one of, it is the most important things in anything related to health. And the way we cultivate our mindset is, I like the principles of hermetic stress. We need to put ourselves into uncomfortable situations. Right now in Thailand, that's what I'm doing. I'm doing cold plunges every morning. We do four minutes in cold water. Your body Ooh. wants to jump out, but you stay. You develop that hormetic stress, right? When you fast, that's what happens. Your body wants to eat, but you, you, you get out of your comfort zone, and it's almost like a muscle. You become more resilient. So you find lifting weights is a hormetic stress. You put your muscles under stress. You, you hurt them. Then they grow stronger. So yeah, no. I, mindset. So the, there is the fixed mindset or growth mindset. So coaching people into going from a fixed mindset to a growth mindset, most important thing. Yeah, no, that's so true. And I like the way you put that 100%. The stressor, I talk about this a lot, that stress is and can be a good thing. It could be a bad thing and it could be a good thing, right? So I think the weightlifting example is a great one because we can all relate to that. When we first lifted weights, we felt like crap. And, and, what you're, and what you're doing is literally tearing down muscle fibers, but that's what produces a hormetic response from the stressor that you created. Fasting for a long period, all fasting relative to what you've done before, but a big time when you get into that long 24, 36, 48, the stressor you are asking your body to do, which in evolutionary times was probably no, it was no problem because they just did that all the time. But now... Yeah, you don't have a choice. Now it's like you got these systems in your body, but you're. <laughs> I tell people it's like taking a chainsaw from a garage that's been sitting down for 15 years and you basically never used it. There's so much rust on that chainsaw. Like you try to crank it, like yeah, chainsaw is unlikely. You know, then it'd be tuned up and oiled up and 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 a lot of work. But that chainsaw is a chainsaw. It's been there the whole time. Our bodies are capable. It, that's why we store and can store so much body fat is as a steady source of fuel to feed us during these times where our ancestors didn't know when the next meal was going to come. So that's always and, and that's why I like the name of your, your social media podcast, you know, Ancestral Living. It, it would be great to go back to this. Of course, progress has made amazing things. I don't want to live back in those days. Can we keep ancestral lifestyle in our modern toxic world? Yes, we can. And we, we were sure, the last conference I, I went to, they were showing that gym class in the 1960s. Everybody was slim. There was maybe one mildly overweight person. Look at gym class nowadays. So if it was a genetic disease, you mean to tell me in 50 years, two generations, two or three generations, we've gone to almost no obesity, to almost 70% of the population is obese. Genes don't change that much. It's Not the that environment fast. that changed yeah. and expressed that gene more. Another example of epigenetics, a lot of studies are coming out now how glyphosate affects our genes. So they've done studies that they showed that mothers who were exposed to high levels of glyphosate, Roundup, that they, are, they followed their kids and they see that those mothers, their children are at a higher risk of developing obesity by the time they were nine years old in fatty liver disease, in kids, almost independent of what they were eating because glyphosate changed the epigenetic and made it that the, the metabolism is different. 
So just being exposed to toxins, sometimes in utero, no fault of your own, gives you a bad epigenetic metabolism. And you have to fight that your whole life. And you know how many pounds of glyphosate we use per year in the U.S.? More than 300 million pounds of Roundup are sprayed on our crops because they use it as a drying agent. Not only does it deplete our food of micronutrients, our foods have lost 80% of their micronutrients and electrolytes. That's why even when you're eating, they did a study, they looked at organic spinach versus canned spinach that they found from World War II. The canned spinach from World War II has so many more antioxidants compared to the organically grown spinach now because our soil is depleted. The, it's stacked against us for our metabolism. It, it's although we try, we get exposed to toxins. The foods we eat have no very little micronutrient value. Fast food is everywhere. Good food is expensive. So everything is stacked against us, but we can still triumph. And that's the mindset, the warrior mindset, that no matter what mindset, that growth mindset, if you get it, you overcome so many things in your life. And if we look at obesity, type 2 diabetes, as something you can overcome, no matter what your genetics are, you can do it. And that's when you use by any means necessary. Whether you have to use GLP-1s, fasting, exercising, any means necessary that's not harmful. Do it, then let your mindset try to keep it. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it takes time. It takes time. It takes practice. It takes, it takes repetition. You got to build habit. You're going to fall off sometimes and get back on. And we have science now to help us with, with an ability to back from a horse that's a lot higher, <laughs> you know, metaphorically speaking. So, man, it's already been an hour. And like, yeah, yeah. Hour, yeah. Uh, I so love much fun, man. I know. Definitely. Definitely. As always, Doc, it's, it's a pleasure having you. And I'm already thinking of the next the next episode. So. <laughs> 